<laughs> Meaning boundary rectifiability. <laughs> okay, let me start by defining harmonic measure for you. Uh, okay, given a domain omega inside Rn, suppose our particle starting from a point x inside the domain follows a Brownian motion and eventually it's going to hit the boundary and possibly exit the domain. And harmonic measure is a probability measure that characterizes this he uh, heating event. Uh, to be more precise, let E be a subset of the boundary. The harmonic measure of this domain is the probability that the Brownian motion starting from x would access the domain from this boundary portion, omega. Okay. Yeah, I should probably use this board since I realized Camilo just moved to the other side. Um, okay, so uh, we can also define the harmonic measure from an analytic point of view. That is also the way that I prefer to study it. Uh, for any continuous function on the boundary, we look at the elliptic equation inside the omega with prescribed boundary value, f. It turns out that the harmonic measure associates the boundary function with the value of the solution by a representation formula. So u, the value of the function at the point x, is the integral of the boundary function against the harmonic measure. I drop the dependence on omega and x for simplicity. More generally, we can consider, instead of the Laplacian, we can consider a divergence form elliptic operator, L equals to negative divergence in the elliptic matrix A of x times gradient. So I consider, instead of the Laplace equation, I consider a solution to this elliptic PDE. And the similar as before, we can define the elliptic measure by the measure for which if we integrate the boundary function, we get the solution. Okay. Uh, for this reason, studying the property of the harmonic or elliptic measure gives us information about the boundary behavior of solutions to this ellipt elliptic problem. Okay, so the central question in this area of study is to study the properties of the harmonic and the elliptic measure, and in particular, we want to understand what is the relationship between this harmonic or elliptic measure if it's an elliptic measure, I use uh, sub-index sub -index x to indicate its ellipticity. What is the relationship between this measure and the boundary surface measure? I denote it by sigma. Um, if the boundary is, for example, C2, sigma is just the usual surface measure. Uh, if not, sigma is defined to be the n minus 1 dimensional Hausdorff measure restricted to the boundary. Uh, because my domain is containing Rn, so the natural dimension of the boundary is n minus 1. That's why I take n minus 1 dimensional Hausdorff measure. Okay. Um, Yesterday at the mathematical conversation, I, I talked about a few uh, cute examples and interesting features of this uh, question. Uh, today I will cut it short and only state a few results that are relevant to my topic today. Um, okay, so firstly, uh, for harmonic measure, meaning if we just consider uh, L equals to the Laplacian, Dahlberg gives 
a sufficient condition to guarantee the mutual absolute continuity between the harmonic measure and the boundary surface measure. He showed that if omega is a Lipschitz domain, uh, that is to say, locally, the domain is the region above a Lipschitz graph. So locally, for any ball, the domain can be characterized as the region above a Lipschitz function, where phi is a Lipschitz function, any Lipschitz function. Then we have that these two measures we care about are mutually absolute continuous. Uh, this means these two measures have the same null set. Uh, if a set has surface measure zero, then the harmonic measure is zero. The, the harmonic measure is zero. The Brownian traveler doesn't see this region, and vice versa. Okay. Uh, in fact, the 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 result is stronger. Moreover, the harmonic measure is of class A infinity with respect to the surface measure. Uh, so let me say what A infinity class means. Uh, if for any epsilon there exists a delta depending on epsilon uh, such that for any point Q on the boundary and any radius less than the diameter. Um, if a set E, which is a subset of the surface ball, which is just a BQR intersecting the boundary, a ball intersecting a boundary gives us a surface ball. If a set E has small measure compared to the measure of sigma. So if sigma e over sigma delta is less than a uh, number delta, then the harmonic measure of the same set would have small measure relative to the harmonic measure of the ball. Okay, uh, You can see this is a quantitative version of mutually absolute continuity. Okay, so this gives us a sufficient condition to guarantee that. And recently, a group of uh, seven authors, uh, Azam, Hoffman, Mattel, Nagarada, <coughs> uh, Gogu, uh, Tulsa and Wahlberg. So they give a necessary condition for that. What they showed is if omega is a domain, if omega is an open connected set with finite surface area, then the harmonic measure is absolutely continuous with the surface measure implies the boundary is rectifiable modulo a harmonic measure null set. The boundary is rectifiable meaning that Modulo a set of measure zero, it is contained in a countable union of n minus one dimensional submanifolds. Okay. And then there's a quantitative analog to that, uh, which was actually proved earlier. Uh, 
so and later um, the assumptions were simplified but uh, I'll state the original version for simplicity <coughs> Um, so, okay. yeah, this is bad planning. I'll continue from here. Uh, okay, so what they showed is if omega is a uniform domain with alpha's regular boundary, I'll explain what those means. then the harmonic measure is of class A infinity implies that the boundary is uniformly rectifiable. So let me explain what those terms means. I put this theorem side by side with or what is the word up and down with this theorem because they can be compared. Uh, so omega is uniform. Okay, we say a domain is uniform if uh, definition by picture for any two point inside the domain x and y. Okay, I, I want this domain to be a little bit more irregular. Uh, okay, so okay, whatever. So for any two point x and y, we can connect them by a curve gamma whose uh, curve length is bounded by a constant multiple of the Euclidean distance between these two points. And also, every point on this curve satisfies uh, its distance to the boundary. is bounded below by a small constant multiplied by the distance of this point to x or why? Uh, what this means is that the further away we are in the curve, uh, the further away we are from x and the y, the further away we need to be from the boundary. So basically, uh, we would have a region, we would have a scar shaped region that connects x and the y. So we will have a fatter region. Uh, in the middle, but thinner region, possibly, in a uh, near x and y. Okay, uh, this is a quantitative way of saying omega is connected with uniform constants, regardless of which points we are at. Okay, uh, yeah, that corresponds to the connectedness assumption of the qualitative result, and we say. The boundary <coughs> is alpha's regular that means um, <coughs> that means for any boundary point and any scale any radius if we look at the surface measure of this ball it is equivalent to r to the power n minus 1. So bounded below by a constant times r to the power n minus 1, bounded above by a bigger constant r to the power n minus 1. Yes? I'm slightly confused because I, maybe I'm missing something. But I think I can prove even stronger than theorem 2. Uh, yes, by, yes. Just by using uh, theory of sets of finite perimeter. Um, because if the boundary has finite um, 
area it is a set of finite perimeter and actually it's a consequence of the Georgi theorem that the boundary of omega is rectifiable modulo a sigma null set. I don't know, okay, okay, no, no, not so sure, not so sure, mm -hmm. not so sure. One has to go there, I'm not so sure. No. So the, the thing about the harmonic measure is uh -huh. it's, there's no variation of formula associated to it. Yeah, yeah, no, but if I mm -hmm. can prove it that it's a uh, rectifiable modulo or a sigma null set, of course, mm -hmm. it's even stronger, right? Yes, so in fact, if you assume this, then you get modulo or sigma null set, yeah. Right, and I was thinking I can actually prove it even without that assumption. Hmm. But okay, I, I, I might be wrong. I might, I might actually, mm -hmm. I might actually making a silly mistake. So, but okay, let, let me take it back. I mean, is this is another the, the, the topological. Value. Yes, exactly, so exactly. So I was thinking, I was thinking you can simply dig into. I, I got that, but I was thinking there's a way of digging it into, you know, finer results in Federer to actually prove that. But but maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm wrong. Yeah, there, there are proof. Yeah, but I mean, once you have that assumption, you 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 are a set of finite perimeter automatically. But still, then your topological boundary can do. Yeah, but the topological boundary can be bad, but I mean, it's it's a bound on the topological boundary. I mean, okay, so I'm I'm, I'm not sure about my claims. So you you could have a four corner contra set which satisfy everything, but it's not rectifiable. You could have a four corner contra set, which is one dimensional. But is it going to be the boundary of a of a of an open set? Uh, okay. You ah, you take the okay. complement yeah, yeah. of. I understand. The I understand. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I understand. And for the for the sets of finite perimeter, actually, that would have measure zero in the perimeter. Measure. Right. Even uh, though okay. the reduced boundary is yeah, rectified. Okay. Now I'm happy with it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That's what I'm Um. Right. Um, so alpha's regularity is a way to quantify the fact that the boundary is a minus one dimensional. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and infinity is a quantified way of saying um, um, mutual absolute continuity. And uniformly rectifiable is to say that okay, the set is the boundary is contained in a countable union of submanifolds. And we have a uniform control on the submanifold, whatever that means. Um, okay. U R. Um, yes. So now let's move on to the case of elliptic measure. Oh. I have another board over there. That's fine. Um, so, okay, adding an elliptic matrix A in the elliptic equation, you can imagine, would introduce another layer of singularity, possibly, even when the domain is very ni nice. In fact, there exists, um, even for, uh, even when the domain is just the unit ball, you can still find elliptic matrix. for which the uh, corresponding elliptic measure and the surface measure of the boundary is singular to each other. Uh, so heuristically, you can understand it from the point of view of stochastic diffusion. Um, so adding an elliptic, adding an elliptic matrix uh, has the following, uh, gives us the following phenomenon. So the bigger the oscillation of the matrix is, then the bigger the drift term is for the original Brownian traveler. So if you have a drift term, then the behavior of the Brownian traveler is more unpredictable. Therefore, you might have singular behavior as well. Okay. Uh, despite this, Koenig and Pfeiffer showed, uh, they, they give a condition on the elliptic matrix to guarantee that this does not happen. So if omega is a Lipschitz domain, and 
if the elliptic matrix, oh, I forgot to say. Can this uh, happen in two dimensions also, or not? Uh, yes, this example is two dimensional. Yeah. yeah. Um, for an elliptic matrix. I, I didn't say what ellipticity means, uh, but uh, to be precise, what I mean is uniform ellipticity. And uh, the matrix is assumed to be bounded. But other than that, I don't assume any regularity on the matrix A. Okay? For an elliptic matrix A, if it satisfies the following assumption, then we have the corresponding elliptic matrix is of class A infinity with respect to the surface measure. The assumption is the follows. Uh, so the matrix A is almost everywhere differentiable, and the gradient of the matrix <coughs> scales like 1 over the distance to the boundary, where delta of x is the distance of an interior point to the complement of the domain. Uh, so this is reasonable. The gradient should scale like one over the distance, uh, one over the distance. Okay? But moreover, we also assume that this condition is more important. This quantity is a Carlson measure. Uh, that is to say, we take any boundary point and any radius. We look at the integral of this quantity, gradient a squares times the distance to the boundary. We integrate that on this ball, bqr. And we scale it by the surface measure of the same ball, BQR. And this quantity needs to be finite, uniformly finite for Q and R. Okay? Um, a good way to understand this condition is to look at the case when the domain is just the upper half plane, uh, the upper half space. So remark. If omega is Rn plus, then. Sorry, Sigma. Mm -hmm. What is sigma of the ball? Or is it sigma of the ball intersected? Yeah, sigma is supported on the boundary, so it's the same. Ah, okay. Yeah, you, you are right. It's, it's okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, okay, so take omega to be the upper half space. Take the running point in the upper half space to be a little x and a t, where t is. Uh, the distance to the boundary in this case, then let me write what this means. So the integral of BQR, this is a ball in Rn times the upper half plane, gradient A square, uh, delta, the distance to the boundary is just t, and then d little x dt, uh, 1 over so now the surface ball is really a constant multiplied by n to the power, uh, r to the power n minus 1. So this ought to be finite, uh, uniformly finite. So another way to write it uh, is more illuminating. So let me put the square here, but then I need to divide by a t. So the first condition tells us this quantity needs to be bounded, but it cannot be scale. It cannot be. Uh, it cannot be like one. It needs to have some decay because if it is one, then this goes away. If you just integrate dx, x is in r n minus one. If you just integrate in x, that cancels with this one. So you are left with the integral of dt over t. That is that diverges. To guarantee this thing is bounded, you need to have some decay of this quantity. Okay, this is how to understand this assumption. So you need to have some control on the oscillation of the matrix as you approach the boundary.
Uh, okay. So now um, the goal of our work initially was to show whether or not elliptic measure distinguish between rectifiable boundary and then purely unrectifiable ones. Just as what harmonic measure does in theorem two and three. If you have nice behavior of the harmonic measure or if you have nice behavior of the elliptic measure, can you say that the boundary is rectifiable? This is our goal. Uh, even uh, what we showed is can be thought of as a converse to kanig pfeiffer theorem. Uh, so basically what we showed is if the matrix is of this class. So let me, for simplicity, let me refer to this assumption as the kanig pfeiffer condition. Uh, what we showed is the following. Okay, so theorem A. Um, let omega be a uniform domain with alpha's regular boundary. Let A of X be a uniformly elliptic matrix defined on omega. Uh, satisfying, okay, such that uh, one uh, A of X satisfies the, the above kanig pfeiffer condition, KP condition, but with a small constant. And secondly, if the corresponding harmonic measure, uh, elliptic measure, sorry, is of class A infinity, then we showed that the boundary is uniformly rectifiable. Okay, because the conclusion we want is a quantitative conclusion, so we have to assume some quantitative uh, assumption, for example, our first regularity. Um, okay, so we proved the theorem by a compactness argument. Um, so we don't know how small the constant ought to be, and also the smallness of the constant. So let me call it epsilon. This epsilon may also depend on other uniform quantities that are floating around in this theorem. Uh, this is not very satisfactory. Uh, but a year later, we were able to remove this smallness assumption. So theorem B is same as above except that uh, for assumption one, we only assume it satisfies Pfeiffer assumption, Pfeiffer condition. Uh, so, okay, one is replaced by uh, let me write it out explicitly since we're going to use it. So the same thing as above. Here we only assume this to be finite. Okay. Uh, in fact, let me define this number to be uh, a constant m. Okay. Um, yeah. Any questions so far? Yeah. Uh huh. Uh, yes. So it satisfied. This is bounded by some number epsilon, which I don't know how 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 big it is. Yeah. Um. So so are these 
conditions uh, in the county park are, are they are they optimal? Oh. Uh, I mean, if, wait, if I violate those conditions, are, are there examples where it doesn't? So there are examples similar to that. So there's a condition which basically controls how big the modulus of continuity of the matrix A is when you go towards the boundary, similar to this one. Um, so if... I understand you need to do that, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah if, you, if you have that type of assumption, yeah. there always exists a matrix A such that its modulus of continuity is controlled by that, but the... Uh, okay, I can write it down. Um, Okay, so there is a modulus of continuity assumption mm -hmm. such that if something like that fails, if you get infinity no, on the right. Of a, not, not on the, gradient, right? the modulus of continuity of an abstract thing. So it tells you for any distance you have a model you have a modulus of continuity. Okay. Then there always exists a matrix A such that its modulus of continuity is bounded above by that. And for that matrix, you have singular behavior. Yeah. So it's not a full converse, but uh, I see. yeah. Okay. So um, yeah, be because this se this seminar covers a broader range of topic. Instead of uh, spending time explaining uh, the proof, the idea of the proof of the theorem, uh, I decided to talk about a general framework of bootstrapping procedure which allows me to go from small constant to big constant. Um, I hope it will be more interesting to, like even if your work is far from what I do, uh, I, I hope it will be interesting. Um. So I need some space. So the framework I'm going to follow uh, is called a method of extrapolation that is proved in uh, Hoffman by, by the work of uh, Hoffman, Mattel, and Maberada extrapolation argument <coughs> or method of uh, extrapolation. Um, it is a strict it is formulated in an abstract format in their work, uh, and uh, it has broad application even beyond that. Uh, but to make things clear, uh, I will use the setting of theorem A and B to state uh, to illustrate how, how this procedure works. Okay, um, first some uh, preparatory work. Um, okay, so given a very general set E, uh, and uh, let sigma be a doubling measure on E. We are go going to use it for E equals to the boundary of my domain and sigma is the Hausdorff measure. Uh, but here we only assume doubling. Doubling just means uh, if you look at the measure of a ball with size 2, it is upper bounded by constant times the ball with half of its size. Okay. So under this abstract assumption, there is a dyadic decomposition of the set E. So for any integer k, there is a decomposition of the set E by 
Uh, okay, so which one do I want to put in front? Okay, K and the J. K is fixed now, and J is the running index, uh, countable running index. E is the union of those cube. I will call them dyadic cubes uh, because their behavior looks like so, but they are not actually cubes. Uh, this satisfies that for K fixed, the diameter of those cubes is bounded above by a constant multiple of 2 to the negative K. Moreover, uh, each cube contains a ball of size equivalent to 2 to the negative k as well. Uh, contains okay. some ball of size little a times 2 to the negative k intersecting e, uh, where uh, the center is on E. Okay. And then they have the tree structure, meaning uh, for every two pairs, JK and J prime, K prime, the two cubes either do not see each other. Or if they do intersect, then one cube is the descendant of the other. Or one cube is the descendant of the other. So they really form this dyadic tree structure coming down. And uh, they also satisfy some thin boundary condition characterized by the boundary, uh, characterized by the associated measure, uh, but this is not relevant, so I won't state it. Um, okay. So, mm -hmm. so these are not actually cubes? No. Uh, so, so one being the descendant of the other, mm -hmm. you just define them via Concu some iterative? Or one just contains the other. Yeah, one contains the other. Yeah. Uh, they they look like cubes because they, they have this property. Yeah. Um, okay, I need some large space. Mm -hmm. Are they comics? Are they comics? I don't know. <laughs> Maybe not. They're just so some sense. Mm -hmm. Whatever they are. Yeah. Okay. Um okay. Suppose the left part of the board would be uh, the space of the boundary, and the right part of the board would be the space of omega. So say this is my domain omega. Okay. Suppose this is <coughs> a fixed cube q uh, a fixed dyadic cube q zero. So in here can think of this is my cube q0. This is what it looks like, even though in reality it's not so nice. It's not a, really a ball. Okay, uh, then associated with this cube q0, we can construct a local domain. So let me use a different color actually. I can define a domain 
uh, in some way omega sub q0. Uh, this is a subdomain of omega, which basically looks like omega intersecting a ball whose radius is roughly the side length of q0. Okay, um, And then I can run a stopping time argument according to some criteria. Uh, A certain good criteria. If a cube satisfies this criteria, then it's a good cube, otherwise it's a bad cube. Uh, for example, we can take the good criteria, here's an N, we can take the good criteria to be uh, some certain ratio on a dyadic cube is bounded by a fixed number A, for example. If a cube satisfies that, it is a good cube. Uh, in this setting, the ratio is defined to be m of the subdomain omega q divided by the surface er the area of q, where this m is the integral of the elliptic matrix. So integral of omega q gradient a square delta x d of x okay so the, the way to run the stopping time procedure is as follows we start from q0 and then we look at all of its dyadic child all of its dyadic children Um, if the cube satisfies the good criteria, it is a good cube. Uh, if, for example, one of the cube does not satisfy the good criteria, it is a bad cube. If it is a bad cube, then we throw it into a collection, some collection of bad cubes, uh, called uh, denoted by f. So q1 would be thrown in the collection of bad cubes. And then for the remaining good cubes, we iterate. We keep looking at their decomposition, looking at their dyadic children. And if it is if it satisfies the good criteria, we keep it. If not, we throw it into F. So for example, this would be the second bad cube Q2, we throw it into F. Okay, uh, so we keep iterating. So for every time we see a good cube, we keep iterating. Every time we see a bad cube, we stop and then do nothing. Eventually, we get uh, a collection of cubes, uh, a collection of bad cubes F. Okay, so then what we do in here, so let me take more of the bad cubes. For example, after Certain steps of iteration, we get another bad cubes here. Okay. Then in here, that means we have uh, we have a bad cubes. This is my Q1. We have a bad cube Q2, and we have a smaller bad cubes Q3. Now I construct a domain, a new domain associated with this good criteria, associated with this collection, with this collection of uh, bad cubes, so that my domain does not touch those bad cubes.
this shaded region is my Omega sub FQ0. Uh, similar as Omega Q0, it is a sub, uh, it is a subdomain of the size of uh, LQ0, but it is detached from the bad cubes, uh, and the distance to the bad cubes is roughly the length of the bad cubes. So this way, our new constructed domains uh, is intact from the bad criteria. So they only keep the good criteria on the boundary. When the boundary has bad behavior, we, we keep it away. Okay? So, so these, these, blue, these blue lines that you drew inside, those are just something like semicircle or what? I mean, uh, so their shape is very zigzag. What's that? It's very zigzag. So it's more like, uh, so basically for how, each... How, how you, yeah, I didn't understand how you do those. So, so uh, for each cube, there is an associated Whitney region whose size is the same as the cube, uh, whose distance is always, is also equivalent to the size of the cube. You keep, so for example, uh, if this is a good cube, yeah. then we keep its associated Whitney region inside Omega. What's the Whitney region? Uh, so it'll be, so for example, I, uh, so we look at a Whitney decomposition of uh, omega, uh, which is a union of I, <coughs> such that I, I's are cubes, and uh, the distance from I to omega is equivalent to its length. And then we take uh, for this, we take the eyes that are uh, have the same distance, have the same length as the good cube, and whose distance to the good cube is also controlled. So for any Q good, good means it do not intersect any of the bad cubes. And this way, we avoid the bad regions because for those bad regions, we remove the Whitney region. We remove the Whitney ice associated to the bad cubes. Yeah. Uh, also, by this construction, uh, the new subdomains inherit whatever geometric structure the old domain has. So, for example, uniform rectifiability and RFS regularity, they all inherit. Okay. Any other question? Um, Okay, so now let me state the proof of this uh, extrapolation argument. So I claim the following. So assuming, so extrapolation argument in the setting of theorem A and B, assuming theorem A holds meaning I have the result when, when the ratio is very small. To prove theorem B, uh, it suffices to show the following. For any uh, dyadic cube Q0, uh, if it satisfies that the ratio is bounded by a constant m, then um, we can find we can find a sub a, a collection of bad cubes. collection of subcubes inside Q0 such that if we remove the regions associated to, with, with those, if we look at this region, its boundary is uniformly rectifiable. But this would be saying nothing unless we have some control on how big this bad collection of set is. So in fact, we also assume the uh, surface area of the remaining region. So if we remove all the bad cubes, 
this is a fixed portion of the original cubes. So 1 minus some constant c times c uh, sigma of q0. Uh, suppose we have that. So notice that by our assumption uh, for every cube, for every dilated cube, the ratio is always bounded by m. Then we can iterate. So if we start from q0, and then uh, there exists a such a collection. So let's say this blue region are the collection of bad cubes. And then we can iterate for each one of those bad regions. We can again apply this claim and remove some bad regions from there. And say remaining the remaining regions are uniformly rectifiable. So similar here, we can remove a portion of the region, but the remaining parts are uniformly rectifiable, similar as in here. Eventually, you get a geometric series, and then you show all of the region, modular set of measure 0 is uniformly rectifiable. Okay? Uh, this is why it suffices to show this claim. But in reality, we don't have this. In reality, all we know that if we have the ratio is less than epsilon, which is the epsilon coming from theorem A. If the ratio is less than epsilon, then we know everything is nice. We don't even need to take out any of the subcubes. We know the entire boundary is uniformly rectifiable. So we want to iterate from epsilon all the way to m. Okay? So let's say this holds for uh, some integer i times epsilon, where i is an integer range from 0 all the way to uh, m over epsilon. And we want to, sh we want to go from uh, the, induction, the inductive hypothesis from hi to hi plus 1. To do that, uh, to prove this, Let's assume the top cube, Q0, satisfies that the ratio is bounded above by i plus 1 epsilon. Okay. Um, and then we ran a stopping time argument starting from Q0. <coughs> the first starting t uh, stopping time argument we run gives us the following lemma, which uh, we, we won't prove. But the statement is the following. Um, so there exists a collection of cubes a collection of subcubes of Q0, similar as before. Such that, um, okay, say this is my uh, F, such that modulo those dyadic region, modulo those sawtooth region that grows out of those cubes, modulo those uh, spikes, we always have the ratio is less than epsilon. So to state it precisely, for any dyadic cubes inside Q0, we have so uh, in graph, this just says um, So no matter which local region we take, as long as we remove this, this uh, sawtooth region, we have nice behavior, we have nice ratio. Okay. But clearly, this is too much to ask, especially if the value of i is very big. We don't expect a big region would have ratio bounded above by epsilon. So we don't expect this to be small. So for all we know, it could be everywhere. We could have a very large portion of f. So for example, okay.
However, we can further decompose f by good and bad cubes, where a, a cube is called a is a good cube if at least one of its children denoted by qj prime satisfies uh, qj prime divided by c qj prime is bounded above by i times epsilon uh, this is not exactly how the stopping process this is not exactly the criteria, but this is essence. This is uh, the idea. Okay. Um, so okay, that means for all the blue regions, a cube is still good uh, if it has at least one child, which is not bounded by epsilon, but at least bounded by i times epsilon. So this is more reasonable to expect. So we reduce from i plus 1 epsilon to i epsilon. So, and then we can also show the collection of bad cubes now is relatively small. So qj, this is bounded by, uh, okay, i plus 1 divided by i plus 2 sigma of the total cube. And this number is bounded by a, num a fixed number that is strictly less than 1. Of course, phi theta 0 would depend on the ratio between m and epsilon. OK? So let's say uh, these are the really bad cubes. They are relatively small uh, for the remaining tubes, okay, so they have good children. Um, okay, so and then, okay, how do I close the argument? So firstly, because of this and because of this condition, so condition dagger, condition dagger with the help of our theorem A tell us, uh, tell us that the sawtooth region removing those Fs has uniformly rectifiable boundary. Okay, that means all the blank region is uniformly rectifiable. And then for the good cubes, so star, for the good cubes, we can use the inductive hypothesis at, uh, at the level i. That means, okay, so, okay, so these suppose, okay, so uh, this is a good cube qj, and this is a good child of the good cube qj prime. By the inductive hypothesis, we know that we can remove a suitable portion of qj prime such that the remaining part is rectifiable. So I can remove can remove those parts, for example, such that after removing that, uh, the rest is good. So for example, here I can remove this portion. Okay. Uh, yeah, I won't write it down because the index is going crazy. Uh, but uh, no, okay, let's remove those. Da 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 da. 
oh, sorry, after removing those, the rest is good. So I can, uh, so the, I can unshade the rest because the rest parts are good parts and they are uniformly rectifiable. So I remove the rest. So now I add a fixed portion to the blank part. Remember the blank part now are uniformly rectifiable. By this inductive procedure, we get a suitable, okay, we get, uh, combining these, we get a new collection F prime, which consists of, uh, okay, which consists of all the bad cubes and the bad regions we rem remove here. But they only take a small portion out of Q0. So union of Qj f prime. So this is greater or equals than one minus, I think that'll be the one, a C times one minus the gamma zero divided by two because this is the region of the good cubes. Uh, sorry, this is the region of the bad cubes. So the good two cubes is one minus the gamma theta zero divided by two times some other constant <coughs> times Q zero. In any case, in the case of this assumption with I plus one, we get a collection of subcubes with a suitable portion. So we proved the hypothesis for uh, I plus one and we closed the argument. Uh, and that finishes the proof of uniform rectifiability. Okay, um, yeah, that'll be all. Thank you.